I'm Najisawat of ForbesNews.com. Dr. Patrick Moore joins us, co-founder and former leader of Greenpeace and leader in the international environmental field for over four decades. Dr. Moore, it's really, really a pleasure to have you with us. Thanks for having me on, Nadia. There's lots to talk about these days. Let's start with the story of how you co-founded uh, Greenpeace. You know, what inspired you and also at the time, what was the state of the environment and the public's perception thereof? Well, as a child, I don't think the word environment was ever spoken. Uh, and certainly ecology was never mentioned. Even when we started Greenpeace, the word ecology was not being used in the popular press, but environment was by that time, of course. Uh, I grew up in absolute wilderness uh, in a, on a floating village in a small bay on northern Vancouver Island with nothing but water and forest around. And no road came to that village. Everything came by boat from, and, and the boats had to navigate open ocean on the west coast of Vancouver Island in the Pacific to get into our harbor. So it was, it was a completely unique childhood that I had there. And, but the school only went to grade eight. I went to school by boat every day because our floating village was about two miles from the fishing village, which was on the land. And there was a small one-room schoolhouse with somewhere between eight and 12 children in the average year in all, all eight grades. Mm -hmm. And I, so I went grade one to eight there and then was sent to boarding school in Vancouver to a sort of English style uh, boarding school, what they call public schools in England. Mm -hmm. And uh, I boarded there and my parents would come a couple times a year uh, to see me. And then I'd go home in the summer back to Winter Harbor and work in the logging camp that my father owned. So uh, that's how I, uh, my childhood, but I, I didn't realize that I had been in, in nature, uh, naturally, it wasn't like something special. It was where I lived. And when I became sort of citified, I realized how lucky I had been and, uh, and, 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 and went into life science just naturally that, cause I was interested in birds and animals and the ocean and shells, shellfish and fish. And I fished all my life. Uh, and, uh, so I, 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 I did a PhD in ecology eventually after doing a Bachelor of Science in Forestry and Biology. And so I had, I was pretty thick into life science uh, already by the time I was 20. And then I, while I was doing my PhD, I heard about this little group that was starting to meet in the basement of the Unitarian Church in Vancouver, which is a church that accepts people from all religions. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, and, and even if, if you don't have a religion like me, accepted you. So uh, I, I joined this group, as a fledgling group of people. We all were pretty much hippies by the looks of us, but everybody actually was a pretty professional-oriented person. There were writers and doctors and lawyers and ecologists and et cetera. And I guess I was the leading life scientist in, in that early group. Because we had, it wasn't about life science, it was about stopping nuclear testing at the beginning. And so we sailed a boat uh, across the North Pacific Ocean in September 71 uh, to protest against the five megaton hydrogen bomb the United States was going to detonate. Mm -hmm. And we managed to get arrested by the Coast Guard and get on Walter Cronkite's evening news nationally in the United States. and. Pretty soon, tens of thousands of people were marching uh, against the bomb. And the day that bomb was detonated, people came from both sides of the border to join hands and, and shut the border down for a day between all across Canada. I mean, that's 4,000 miles or whatever. And uh, every border crossing was shut down. And it was a really big demonstration. Uh, and it's, it's a long time ago now, so hardly anybody remembers it because they weren't born yet. But many, many people... Uh, and that began Greenpeace. And then we went, uh, we won. President Nixon canceled the, the, the future tests of nuclear weapons in, in Alaska. That was the last time the United States de detonated a hydrogen bomb. It was very significant. And also the, the, the beginning of the environmental movement was happening right there. And 
so then we went against French atmospheric nuclear testing in the South Pacific. The French public didn't even know that their government was still testing nuclear weapons down there. It was never printed in because the government owned all the press that controlled it. And so we went to Paris and, and demonstrated in Notre Dame Cathedral while our boat was on its way to Muro Atoll in French, in French Polynesia where they were detonating these bombs in the air and sending radiation around the whole world. It took two years, but we stopped it. And so, but a lot of people thought we must be commies if we were trying to stop U.S. and French nuclear testing and weren't going after the Russians. Well, going after the Russians, we'd come out in a coffin. So uh, it, it didn't make any sense for us to, the Russians should be doing that. Not, not us, because we were the enemy. And so it, it did have that element to it. So we didn't get much support, of course, from the United States government or the French government, for that matter. But we beat it. We beat them. And, and again, this was at the height of the Cold War and the height of the nuclear arms race. Uh, and that was the pinnacle of it, too. It, it, it eased off after that, because, partly because of the atmosphere we had created. Uh, and getting people aware of the, how dangerous the situation was that, 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 and what a nuclear war really would do uh, to, to our world. And we're sort of uh, in, in a space like that now in a little bit. Uh, it's, it's as close as it's been to that kind of a atmosphere since then, I would say. Mm -hmm. uh, but on the other hand, I think people have thought enough about how much ruin there would be, not, not to the other side, but to your side too, if ever such a thing happened. So I'm, I'm a bit optimistic on that front, but not very optimistic on the energy front. And so we, we, we then went on, uh, just in, and, and many of our followers thought, what kind of crazy goose, where, where, are you going to be saving whales after, after, <laughs> you, after you stopped nuclear war, you're now going to save the whales? What's that got to do with anything? <laughs> and and so we lost a few followers, but we set out into the Pacific for four years in a row every summer when the Russians were killing and the Japanese were killing 30,000 large whales every year still in the, in the 1970s, mainly for their oil and for, for pet food. And uh, the oil of the sperm whale is a special type of oil. It's used in fine machinery. But it's also possible to grow uh, a bean, which has a, just as good oil in it, and then you don't have to slaughter uh, a whale. And so we stopped that. Uh, by, by 1981, whaling was banned in the entire world because of what we did. We got out and got in front of the harpoons. And the pictures of us in a little boat in front of the harpoon with the whale being killed went around, went around the world. And that's what really made us famous. We weren't that famous when we were doing the nuclear testing stuff. It was you know, it, they got in the newspapers, but when we did the Save the Whales campaign, we just got everybody excited and interested in in being able to do such a thing as to stop that. And and because it was the Japanese and the Russians, it was sort of balanced in terms of East and West, uh, and it, we didn't have that same uh, attitude of thinking that we we're a bunch of communists because we were actually going against the communists. And, and uh, that, that, that's what made us catch on fire, and pretty soon millions of dollars were involved, and people were just throwing money at us, and we started doing some really uh, good stuff. We stopped the, the capture of orca whales. I, I was the leader of that campaign on, on Vancouver Island, where the last, the last attempt to capture an orca whale was thwarted by us, and that was the end of that. They'd already taken nearly a third of the population of the west coast of, of, of North America. They did, after that, start taking some whales from Iceland, but that too has ended, uh, I believe. And I don't think anybody is catching orca whales anymore. We got to that point, and we were famous around the world. But with that, then we turned to a very serious problem, which was the, the damaging of the rivers and lakes, particularly. Uh, with toxic waste from factories, especially in Europe. North America had adopted some pretty good uh, air and water pollution control laws uh, in 72 under Nixon. Again, 
it's funny, and I mean, next Nixon is remembered for the Watergate break-in, but he actually stopped nuclear testing and stopped uh, killing whales and 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 stopped t- toxic waste. He, he he was behind all of those things, and we uh, the rivers of Europe, though, uh, like the Elbe and the Rhine and the Thames, they were all poisoned. There was almost no life in them because factories were putting their waste into the river underwater where no one could see it in a pipe. And we took a smaller boat than, than the ones we'd used on the high seas. They were like 150-foot boats. We took more like a 75-foot boat that could go up the rivers, and we put scuba divers in the water to block the pipes where the where the waste was coming out, and it backed up into the factory. And that image and that fact intrigued the media, and we got a lot of press for uh, plugging the pipes of these industries. And today, there's fish in all those rivers, and so you know it was really a shame when Greenpeace went bad, largely because it was hijacked by the political left, because they saw the the money and the political power that we'd created. We weren't political particularly. I've never been political. I've avoided it like the plague because I believe that we should just judge every situation on its merit and not just say, I'm a Republican, so I support this, that, and the other thing, or I'm a Democrat and I support this, that, or the other thing. It doesn't doesn't make sense to me. I understand that it's legitimate to have political parties. I just don't want to be in one. And and I'd rather be uh, a free agent, so to say, to make up my own mind and to study things. I always say when I see a, a situation or a problem, I don't just look at it from here. I walk all the way around it and look at it from every direction I can imagine to try to understand it better. And uh, and now now we've got a situation where politics and science are being confused with each other. People are saying that there's a, a consensus that humans are causing uh, a, a, a global catastrophe, a global, you know, extreme weather and all this stuff that it's caused. So there's a consensus, is there? Well, that's not how science works. I mean, if you look at any invention or, or, or discovery that's been done, that's why there's a Nobel Prize to, to, it, to, to give to individuals who have exceptionally discovered something. Things aren't discovered by committees. Rules are made by committees after the discovery has been made. But to separate science from politics is absolutely essential, and it's they're being confused uh, totally in the Western world. I I think that, you know, I don't want to live in Russia or China particularly, although Moscow is such a beautiful city. Um, I don't want to live there particularly because of their political structure, But I think they do a better job in some ways of discerning the difference between knowledge and politics. And because politics is really just about policy. But but if you make policy based on bad science, you get bad policy. You can even get bad policy based on good science if you're not smart enough. But the, the, the truth of the matter is, is that there is no hard evidence that carbon dioxide is causing anything to happen to the temperature of the earth. There's none. It is totally theoretical. And, but the, the reason I called my book Fake Invisible Catastrophes and Threats of Doom is because they are, they, they are focusing on things that nobody can see and making up stories about. You can't disprove it. It'll be the very hardest thing to disprove. It's impossible because you, you can't see it. And Science is the first rule of science is observation. You have to you have to observe something, not just it doesn't have to be with your eyes. It can be with a microscope or with a microphone, or it can be with any tool you can imagine. Radiation is the other one besides carbon dioxide. Those are the two main ones that are that are in the invisible category. So they blame everything on carbon dioxide practically. Uh, what, and and then the other category is remote. And that's why polar bears and coral reefs are the icons, because again, hardly anybody can see them or go there. Now, who goes to the North Pole and counts all the polar bears? When in fact, and and who, why is it that the media never mentions the treaty 
that was signed in 1973. Like it wasn't in eight, it wasn't in a thousand years ago. It was in 1973. Mm. A treaty was signed among all the polar nations, which are six, to end the unrestricted hunting of polar bears in 1973. Because wildlife biologists went to the governments and said they're killing. There's, it's too easy for rich people to go up there in a plane and hire a guide and get a polar bear or two. And there was no restriction. They could take as many as they wanted. So that was ended and, and enforced and has been ever since. And that's why the polar bear population has grown three to five times larger than it was then. Which no one will ever believe because all we see is photographs of lone polar bears on sheets of ice that are about to bring to the melt. Bear. Yes, their common name is sea bears, as in S E A bears. They, when they go, jump off a, a, an iceberg and start swimming, <laughs> they know where they're going. You know, it's not as if they're going to swim out to sea and drown. Uh, the, more people drown every year than polar bears do, and you know, it it, it is. Ridiculous to suggest that a polar bear doesn't know how to figure out things. And you see, we know that polar bears can survive through much warmer periods than what we're in now, because the the the, the three interglacial periods that came before this one, which is known as the Holocene, it's about ten thousand years into it now, and okay. so it's about time for it to end, like in the next hundreds of years somewhere. We're in an ice age, but the glacial the glacial maximums of which there have been 40 or more, have all occurred within the last 2.6 million years in the Pleistocene Ice Age. We are now in an interglacial period, but it's still colder than it was for the 250 million years prior to that. Everything is upside down, Nadia. Everything's upside down. They're saying there's too much CO2 when there's never been so little. They're saying it's too hot when it's actually colder than it's been almost a whole time of the Earth right now, because that's why all that ice is on the poles. There's a lot, you know, and they show a picture of the ice in the summer after six months of sunshine, 24 hours a day. But in the winter, every square inch of the Arctic Ocean, plus ocean down even further south than that, is frozen, solid. They never show you that one. It's still that way every winter. And the, it, they've got people thinking that the ice is disappearing in the Arctic and the Antarctic, which it's not. One of the most dire and doom and gloom predictions made by uh, climate alarmists is that we are in the midst of abrupt climate change, and it's going to be methane from the Arctic, which will lead to human extinction. Some scientists, such as Professor Guy McPherson, believes it'll be um, by 2026. And you've recently said that that is so far from the truth. How is it possible that there are two such conflicting theories? Is there not sufficient data and evidence that can be used to refute disastrous claims like that of Professor McPherson? Yes, there are. It's not difficult. It's not difficult to to explain uh, the the history of the temperature and the CO two on the Earth. But people only go back to 1850, and you know when when industrialization began. And they say that's sort of like when it's like as if they think the earth began then. It actually began 4.6 billion years ago. And when, when modern life emerged, which was about half a billion years ago, before that it had all been the little tiny unicellular plankton in the sea. But sexual reproduction occurred about 2.5 billion years ago. The photosynthesis occurred even earlier than that. So life developed a, lo a lot of what we would consider to be very miraculous processes early on. But when multicellular life emerged, that was the what called the Cambrian explosion about, about 540 million years ago. Larger life forms came into being with organs and flippers, and but they didn't have any shells or backbones. They were all just like jellyfish at first. And then gradually... Gradually, many of these multicellular organisms learned to combine calcium with carbon dioxide in the ocean and make shells for themselves. If you start thinking about all the marine creatures, a huge percentage of them, including the corals, which is about 50% of all the calcium carbonate that is produced 
by marine life. All of the limestone in the Earth's crust was made by life. And the marble and the chalk, the, the, the white cliffs of Dover are made of the skeletons of coccolithophores, which are a unicellular plant that makes a shell for itself. And, and you can imagine how, how important that would be. Instead of just being a naked blob of jelly, you now have a thick, hard shell on your, to, to surround yourself, and it's like a knight in armor. And so that was a huge advance in the, in the evolution of life. Like there's the crabs and, and snails and barnacles and clams and oysters, and it goes on and on and on and the coral reefs. And uh, so that was a huge uh, benefit. But unfortunately, inadvertently, it meant that the CO2 in the ocean and the atmosphere, because they are connected at the surface of the ocean, the ocean and the atmosphere are in equilibrium with regard to their CO2 content, the ocean containing about 50 times as much CO2 as the atmosphere. So when these shells started pulling carbon dioxide out of the ocean to make their shells, it started going down from about 5,000 parts per million at the time that that shell process was invented to 180 parts, from 6,000, 5,000 to 6,000 to 180 mm -hmm. at the peak of the most recent glacial advance. And then this went 20,000 years ago. It went down to went down to 180 parts per million, which is only 50 parts per million above the death of plants. Because plants don't just need CO2 to live, they need a certain concentration of it. And use 180 parts per million is only 0.018%. And we are currently, according to most sources, we are 0 0.04. Yeah, 0 0.425 or so. Yes, we have... We have uh, we have increased the, the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere by about 50%. And this is one of the best things that is, has happened in the history of life. And humans did it inadvertently, just like the shellfish inadvertently caused the CO2 to decline so drastically over half a billion years. We have come back and saved life from a certain demise. No other species could do this could find the fossil fuels. It highlights our ability to adapt. And we are also evil for doing this. And it's, it's kind of like a death wish, I think. I, I don't know why these things come about, but there was a time when people burned women as witches with absolutely no evidence whatsoever of what a witch we even was, mm -hmm. right? And throwing virgins into volcanoes was fairly popular back in the day. And mm -hmm. all through history, there have been pogroms and... Uh, you know, the, 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 the Germans murdering 8 million people of a certain genetic extraction. I mean, whoa, we, we, are, we can be evil. But the, the thing is, this, this thing about the climate, it's the, it's the people who are calling us deniers who are actually the evil ones because they are, when you, when you call a person a denier, we're not denying that the climate changes. No, <laughs> So why don't, why don't they use straight language? You, you, you know, accuse us of what we are actually believing, which is that CO2 is a net benefit to life on Earth. That's what we believe. Huh. We've just, we're just about to be joined by one of the winners of the 2022 Nobel Prize for Physics in our CO2 coalition in Arlington, Virginia, which is right, right on the border of Washington, D.C., and I've been a, I was a founding director along with Will Happer and Dick Linson. I interviewed Dr. Linson last week and Professor Happer last year. And I actually wanted to mention earlier when you referred to it as a death wish, that Professor Happer said that this drive towards net zero, it's a suicide pact. Correct. And Dr. Linson said last week that it's almost as if the environmentalists have decided to commit suicide. If net zero were actually achieved, that is the end of net amounts of CO2 going into the atmosphere. How close do you think we are to that? We're, we're never going, it's never going to happen. Uh, the only way it could happen is if we adopted nuclear energy on a large scale. And that could be done. In a hundred years, we could be 
basically get get off of at least 50 to 75 percent of the fossil fuels you're losing to, using today. Everything stationary can be a, can be provided by nuclear energy, heat and electricity. My concern here is where will we get our CO2 from? We get our CO2 from uh, the the atmosphere and the ocean, and at this at this point in in history of the Earth, it has been declining steadily for at least half a billion years, up and down, just like the temperature goes up and down. But generally, we are now we're in a place to we're in the Pleistocene ice age. This is one of forty or more interglacial periods where it gets a little bit warmer than it is during the, the glacial advances. Canada was covered in over a mile of ice from, from one side to the other during the most recent glaciation, and so was it during all the previous ones, of which there were 40. And in between, you get a, you get a situation where it's halfway as livable. Canada, that is, because less than half of it is lived in. It's you know, 90% of Canadians are within 100 miles of the U.S. border for a good reason. The further north you go, the more inhospitable it becomes. People forget that humans are a tropical species. We are not an Arctic species. We're not polar bears or penguins. We evolved at the equator, and if it weren't for fire, clothing, and shelter, we couldn't have moved out of Africa. It's the only reason we were able to do so. So, And those are all three very important things in our lives, fire, shelter, and clothing, especially if you live in a cold place. You know, I'm in Baja, California, uh, which is part of Mexico right now, yeah. and it's a beautiful warm day, but it gets cold enough here in the winter down into the teens and tens that if, we d if, if, if people came here and didn't have fire, shelter, and clothing, they would die out very quickly. Even here, and I'm, I'm at the Tropic of Cancer. Humans could not live at the Tropic of Cancer without fire, shelter, and clothing, and even in the, even at the equator, there's nights that are cold enough that you want to have a big animal skin on you while you're sleeping. Mm. You know, that <laughs> you, could call, you could call that clothing. But I like to talk about coral reefs for a bit because there is this myth that they're going to die if it gets too hot. Funnily enough, though, the most biodiverse coral reefs in the world are in the warmest ocean of the world, which is the Indonesian archipelago. And that's where there's over 600 species of coral and over 2,000 species of reef fish, by far the most biodiverse in the world. The Caribbean is the next most diverse, and it happens to be the second warmest ocean in the world. So the truth is, if the world warms, the corals will expand to a much larger range than they occupy today. That's the truth. And even the people who study coral try to avoid saying that, because if you say that, it means you don't believe that global warming is going to destroy the coral, right? And if you don't believe that global warming is going to destroy the coral, then you're not on our side. And then you won't get any more money from the politicians through the bureaucrats into the universities. That's where the quiet side of this whole thing is. Everybody hears the commotion from the media and from the Greens and, all, and all the, from the World Economic Forum and all these people. But where the real business is taking place is where politicians are instructing their bureaucrats to give scientists in the universities where 80% of all the research in the United States is done, is in universities. And if you're a professor in a university, you don't go along with the climate thing. You're not getting any money, period. And with few exceptions, very few exceptions. And so, and this is the consensus is being paid for, right? And bought, bought and paid for. And that's what's going on. And so then all the noise comes from from the scientists, from the from the media, from the Greens, and they're all in coots together, uh, making a whole pile of money out of this. Mm -hmm. And it, it it is there. There have always been doomsday scenarios, and, and and yet for some reason doom has never occurred. I mean, like the end of the earth. You know, it's just never seems to come about, no matter how long, how often you predict it. You just feel like going, wake up, people, wake up. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Nothing like a good disaster to make the news. It, <laughs> yeah. It's human nature's latest thing. Everything is fine today, so we have nothing to say. <laughs> that is one of the arguments that the very devoted to the narrative in terms of climate change people argue when it comes to 
scientists that disagree with the, cons- the consensus that they're not going to be around for long enough to have, you know, their predictions and advice end up killing people. It's not going to upset them. Well, most of the people who, like myself, are willing to tell the truth about this are not in the, in the clutches of some economic necessity. Uh, if you're working for a living and you, st- you, you, and you defy the narrative of consensus about climate disaster, uh, you, you're, you're, not, you're gonna be shunned. And, and I am shunned by these people and they, they call me names. That's all they can seem to have come up with is calling me names. And uh, and I don't see what that has to do with science myself. I've never worked for the fossil fuel industry in my life. But everyone, what else did you do? Yeah, well, I don't know why. I mean, I haven't. There's no record of it. Uh, I haven't hidden anything in my. I've been a very open person all my life. I've never told a lie. And 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 that is that is that is the truth. I don't tell lies. Uh, and some people do. I mm-hmm. think. And some people, I think they know they're lying. I'm not sure. You can't, you can't see inside a person's brain. But the truth of the matter is, is there is no evidence of a climate catastrophe. All they're talking about now is extreme weather events, which have been going on since the beginning of time. And forest fires, for goodness sakes. It, most forest fires are caused by uh, people carelessly f- failing to put out uh, campfires and throwing cigarette butts out the window and that sort of thing is a lot of them. But lightning has been here forever, right? And lightning is causes forest fires. But the reason that these fires are so severe today is due to mismanagement. If you if you imagine back in the day when I was talking about when all all the energy was from wood, every end of every summer, the people went out from cities and towns and gathered all the dead wood in the forest. That's the first they would take because it's the easiest to take and it's already dry. So this really reduces the, the chance of a catastrophic wildfire going up into the crown of the trees and starting the whole place ablaze. That is, if you look at the United States, they, in the West, a huge amount of land is owned by the federal government, national parks, national forests, Bureau of Land Management land. So it's controlled from Washington where most of the politicians are from the east of the Mississippi. Most of the f- federal lands are west of the Mississippi. Idaho is 70% federally owned. So they don't have, they don't care really about what happens there. And so the, the, the forests in the east of the country, down along the, the southern states, Georgia, Mississippi, Louisiana, they're covered in forest. They almost never have forest fires because they're managed properly. Because the people who own them want to get the wood, not to have a charred forest left behind. The people who are, who, who are owning the federal lands in the Western United States don't really care that much. And then they can use that as a way of saying, look what the climate has done to our environment. It's causing these forest fires. No, you are causing the forest fires because you won't let people manage them properly. What about temperature changes? IBCC reports. Dr. Lindzen said that there's really actually just one working group that deals with science. And now they did not actually come up with anything that posed an existential threat. Scientists will look at the data. They won't come up with doomsday predictions, but they'll leave it open-ended and leave the politicians do with it what they will. Now, the IPC's reports don't say that there's doomsday coming. They don't say that. They say the temperature has risen one degree in the last 250 years, which is true. We're in a warming period. It's a slight warming period. We've been in cooling periods and warming periods all through the Holocene. The Holocene was warmer than it is now, 8,000 years ago, until about 6,000 years ago. It was warmer than it is now, even though it's getting warmer now than it was 200 years ago. It goes up and down, but sometimes it goes up and down downwards, and sometimes it goes up and down upwards. Mm. That's just a fact. It, it wobbles. There's, dip, there's cycles on cycles on cycles, and there's like El Nino and La Nina, and all of the, these short cycles, and then there's longer cycles and longer still cycles, and then there's things we just don't even understand at all, like mm-hmm. why the Earth went into another ice age 2.6 million years ago when there was no ice on the Earth at all for the 250 million years before that, 
when the Karoo Ice Age ended, which had lasted a hundred million years during the Carboniferous period. Extreme weather is one thing, but damage caused to people is another. The, the number of people being killed by extreme weather has gone down by 98% in the last 200 years. It's actually just in the last, it's actually just in the last hundred years since the 1920s. It's been proven that this is the case. And most people die, who died from weather in those days was by starvation, but because what the weather did to their crops, right? It, 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 it's, it's unbelievable how much less danger there is for people today than there was just 100 years ago. Much less danger. And a lot of it is because of fossil fuels and, and, and nitrogen fertilizer. Uh, it, 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 people, I mean, it's only a hundred years they have to look at there and to see that there's definite proof that on a per capita basis, there's been a 98% reduction in death from extreme weather. And that includes all extreme weather of every kind. It's just been published and, and, and it is not being carried by the mainstream media. I mean, they should have, this as their top story. In 2010, this is 40 years after you co-founded Greenpeace, the organization comes out with a statement saying that you were in fact not a founding member. What is it that you observed in the organization that led to you walking away? I mean, it must have been a really difficult decision to walk away from something that you were that sincerely passionate about. It was an easy decision to make because I had no choice. I had no choice for two reasons. First, much of the environment, we started out with a fairly strong humanitarian orientation to save civilization from nuclear war. That must mean you care about people at least a little bit. And it came to the point where the environmental movement, including Greenpeace, was basically characterizing humans as the enemies of nature. We are the enemies of the earth. It was sort of like human beings are, are the only evil species on the planet. And even cockroaches are better than we are type thing. So this is the philosophical uh, level, high philosophical level of, of this judgmental idea that human beings are the enemies of nature. And then came a, a campaign proposal from people who had no science education. I was the only one who had a formal science education on the International Board of Greenpeace for the whole of those 15 years. My fellow directors, none of whom had any formal science education, decided that Greenpeace should d start a campaign to ban chlorine worldwide. That was the slogan. And I said to them, you guys, you got to be a little more nuanced than that because chlorine happens to be one of the most important elements for human life that there is. Table salt, for example, is sodium chloride, and it is an, es it is an essential nutrient. Chlorine, yes, we're talking about chlorine, which is one of the ha halogens, which c includes uh, fluorine, bromine, chlorine, iodine, and argin arginine, I think it's called, or something like that. There's a, the, this group of chemicals is one of the most reactive group of chemicals in the whole periodic table. It's aggressive. And he, if, of course, we know that elemental chlorine gas can kill you really quickly because it combines with everything, auto, just right like that. And uh, so, because there, there is no, the reason there's no chlorine gas around is because it's, it's combined with something else like sodium. It's, it, it doesn't, it can't, it can't exist freely in the atmosphere. It has to get attached to something. <laughs> and it gets attached to lots of things, some of which are the most important things in medicine. 85% of all our pharmaceuticals are made with chlorine chemistry, and 25% of our medicines actually have chlorine in them. And table salt, sodium chloride, which is an essential nutrient for all life, uh, that's why Gandhi marched to the sea to make salt, uh, was because the British were taxing the poor people in India uh, for something that, that was essential. And, uh, and so he, it was one of his greatest achievements was this mar making salt by the sea. And, uh, he, he, and then in addition to that, adding chlorine to drinking water is the biggest advance in the history of public health and to swimming pools and spas. You don't, you don't have a hot tub without chlor chlorine or bromine pucks floating around in a thing. You don't do that because you don't want to spread disease. And so I'm going, you guys, you still going to do this? Have a, 
campaign to ban chlorine worldwide. Yep, we're going ahead. Once we came to the issue of toxicity and chemicals, you have to have some science. You don't need any science to want to stop nuclear war. You don't need any science to save 30,000 whales from being killed every year. You don't have to be a whale scientist for that. But if, if you're going to deal with chemistry, you have to have some science because the first rule of, of, of chemistry uh, uh, in many ways is the toxicity is in the dose. So table salt is essential at a small dose, then you, then you can take too much of it, but it still doesn't hurt you. You don't need that much of it, but it doesn't hurt you. Then it starts to hurt you. If you, if you. if you took a cup of salt and put it in your stomach, you're dead. Also in the final analysis, Greenpeace was hijacked by the political left because they were smarter at politics than we were, because we weren't really politicians. We were, we were campaigners. And, uh, and we knew how to do that. We knew, we, we knew how to get people's attention. We knew what the real issues were. And all of a sudden, these guys are saying that chlorine should be banned. And it was just a fundraising program based on, based on in, in, incorrect information. So how could I be involved in that? It, so there was no choice. I had to go. I always say I blame McTaggart. David McTaggart became our chairman. He was kind of a very, very interesting person. Uh, he was friends with the Aga Khan and with the head of the science division in Moscow for for Russia and all kind of high level people. Um, the person who founded CNN, you know, um, uh, he 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 was a real a real mover in society. But he had no science, and he really believed that everybody was going to be poisoned by chemicals. That the modern civilization. And all the plastics, you know how people say that plast they act as though plastic is toxic, right? Well, is that why we wrap our food in it? Go on the internet and, and look for uh, plastic in the stomachs of albatross chicks. And you'll see these made up pictures of a dead albatross chick sliced open, full of plastic, right? This does not happen in, in the world. It is true. It is true that, that, that the parents of albatross chicks in the nest bring bits of hard plastic and other such materials and, and give it to the chick for its gizzard to grind its food. Birds don't have teeth. So plastic is actually performing a useful function for seabirds. They have two stomachs. One has hard objects in it that the when the chicks are in this nest, they can't go out and get it for themselves. But then for the rest of their lives, all birds ingest hard objects of a certain size and shape to, to put in their gizzards to grind their food because they have no teeth. They can't chew their food. So if, 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 a, mother, if a mother bird gives its, its chick a squid eight inches long, you know, like that, it, it, it goes to the gizzard where it gets ground up, except for the beak of the squid, which is retained as a hard object to continue helping digest the food. And this is all well understood. For 60 years, it's all been understood. Scientists at first, when they saw that birds were using plastic as one of the objects that they gave their chicks to digest their food, were worried about it. But they came to realize that it causes no harm. As a matter of fact, it works just as well as pumice stones and pieces of wood and bit nuts that fall off trees into the sea. It's hard to find those hard objects in the sea. There's no, there's no pebbles in the sea, whereas on land, birds just use pebbles about the size of a marble and smaller. So this is all just total fake. And the other thing that plastic does in the sea is it acts as a substrate, just like driftwood does, for marine life to grow on, and then for other species to eat the marine life that's growing on the piece of plastic. It's like a little floating reef. Did you know that there is no such thing as the, the Pacific Garbage Patch, which I'm sure you've heard of? There isn't such a thing, because it's invisible. It's in the middle of the Pacific Ocean where no one can look out the window and see whether it really exists. So they made it up and made paintings of it. They, you go on the internet and look for Great Pacific Garbage Patch, you'll find all these made-up cartoon-like things, which show this is the Pacific Garbage Patch, and they take a brush and paint a big blob on a map of the Earth that they made up. And, and the, the, only thing, the, the only thing that is a real picture 
that claims to be part of the Pacific Garbage Patch, right underneath it says this is part of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. And I looked at it, and it's a big sea of debris in the ocean, a huge sea of debris. And I looked, and in the background, there were mountains. And I'm going, there's no mountains in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. It turns out this was the debris that was washed off of Japan during the tsunami that killed 20,000 people. And it was all the towns, the towns all just destroyed. And, and that's why there were mountains in the background, because that was Japan. And they pretended that it was the Pacific Garbage Patch. It's on the internet. Just go on the internet and say Pacific Garbage Patch, twice the size of Texas, they say, and growing, and growing f faster than we ever imagined. And it's not true. The, most of the plastic in the sea is discarded fishing gear, and that is an issue that should be addressed. But the problem is, is fishermen want their boats to be used for putting fish in and nets in that work, not discarded, net, not nets they want to get rid of if they're damaged, which happens a lot with nets. So they just throw them overboard. So maybe somebody should get together with the fishing industry and see if they can't help them figure out a way maybe to hang a hang them off the bow so that they're not taking up room in the boat. Because the boat, they want the boat for ice and fish. Because boats have a limited amount of room in them, fishing boats. So th that's why they throw, the, throw it away. But it isn't as though people are out there shoveling plastic into the ocean. You know, it, 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 it's true that plastic gets into rivers, and especially in, uh, in Southeast Asia, it, it, it was really quite awful to see. All of the... the, the the people who are selling vegetables and stuff are often on the bank of a river and they just throw everything that they don't want away, rotten food and plastic wrappers and the whole thing goes into the river. I sure that you also wonder what the possible end goal could be. Do you think that the motivation is purely a profit? Because only very few people are benefiting from this. Do you think it's control? I'd say it's more control than money. Yes, I do. I believe it's a, a basically it's a communist kind of approach to the situation, and and I'm 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 not joining. I'm afraid. That's just how how I see it. Uh, I I I think people. I think many people are are innocent, innocently being pulled into this fear. Uh, but many people are doing it on purpose and ex exaggerating it to such an extent. Uh, the, the earth is, is actually doing quite fine right now. The human species can be immensely proud of itself in retrospect, not because we did it on purpose, but because we have reversed the decline of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which no other species could have done. And this is a good thing, the replenishment Every molecule of CO2 we emit came from the environment in the first place and was turned into fossil fuels or turned into limestone, which we use to make cement, and that produces 10% of our CO2 emissions. The other 90% is almost all fossil fuels. And all of that CO2 that we are emitting from the fossil fuels came from the atmosphere in the first place. We are just putting it back where it came from. And when it was there, life flourished. So that's all you need to know. You really don't need to know anything more than that.